today we're in for a wonderful treat because we all know that none of us would be in business if it weren't for our customers. And so today we have Steve Dorfman, who's the CEO of Driven to Excel, who will be sharing with us how to anticipate our needs for our, our customers' needs. And so I'm excited to get this information. If you don't already have pen and paper in hand to take feverish notes, please do so. And without further ado, I'd like to actually bring up Mr. Steve Dorfman. Steve and I have known each other for quite some time, and it's just been a pleasure to get to know him better. And I'm amazed at the great things that he does to support the small business community. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks for inviting me out today. At 23 years old, I started working in the car business, and I did that for 11 years locally here at Rosenthal Acura up the street. So from 1995 until 2006, I was a car salesman. I hope I didn't lose any of you with that. <laughs> That's all you're going to remember about me. Uh, so I've been doing this for nine years, but for the 11 years before that, I was, I was uh, selling cars. So I, I want to share something with you from, from my uh, days of selling cars that helps to illustrate this, uh, th this, the power in anticipating client needs. So as you might imagine, most people that were coming in to purchase a new car, uh, they were leaving their old car behind. So they had a trade-in or they had a lease that they were turning in, right? So there was an exchange that was taking place. Well, one thing I started to notice very early on is that uh, most people weren't just leaving their car with us. They were leaving with us their CDs and their CD changer, their sunglasses and their sunglass holder, their coins and their coin tray, their garage door clicker clipped to their <laughs> visor, and their easy pass velcroed to the windshield, right? Everybody seemed to leave something behind. The other thing that, that clients weren't uh, remembering to do is bring their title with them. I had colleagues that would, that would look at this and say, how could customers, they didn't even call them clients, I, li I, I like to refer them as, as, as clients, I think it sort of elevates the game, but they would say, how could customers be so stupid, how could they not know that they need to bring their title with them if they're going to be trading in a car? Well, I would say customers don't go to customer school. Clients don't go to client school, right? It's our job to anticipate those needs. And so at 23 years old, I decided, look, if these are the things that people are forgetting to do, why not provide them with a checklist? This is 1995. Some people had their first AOL account. Some people checked it like once a week. And so I, would, I put together this checklist and I emailed it to them. And I also snail mailed it because oftentimes we were working by appointment. If, it, if somebody bought a car, it took a day to get it ready. They'd come in the next day. So by snail mail, they'd have this checklist ready to go. And it would mention all these things that most clients tend to leave behind, but it would also say, you know, uh, you might also want to remember to bring with you the owner's manual for the old car, the extra keys, the extra remotes, the service records, right? All these things that seem to clutter up our homes that we find, you know, months or years later, like, oh, here's an old key fob from I don't know what car, and somebody could have used that, right? So this, uh, this anticipatory nature of doing business really paid off over time. So I was there for 11 years. I was salesman of the year seven years in a row, and I was in the top 1% of the country in customer satisfaction, the customer satisfaction index, which is the industry standard. Yes, I knew how to sell, but really, I promise you, it had so much more to do with providing a great customer experience. Really, that's what it was about. It wasn't about being a great salesperson. It was about anticipating client needs. That was a big, huge part of it. Now, there is a, um, a perception problem in business when it comes to when it comes to this, this, this notion of customer experience. Because when you ask companies what kind of uh, experience they're delivering and then ask their clients what kind of experience they're delivering, you might get two different answers. Here's proof of that. Bain & Company, a big management consulting firm that's been around for a long time and consults with big multinational brands like Costco and Intuit and Enterprise, Rent-A-Car and Hallmark and other big names. Bain does uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, research and, and, and studies and one of the things they found is that they, they, they asked 362 companies to categorize their level of customer experience. And 80% of those companies, 80% of those 362 companies said, the experience we're delivering for our customers is, quote, superior. That was the word they chose, right? Superior. What percentage of their clients do you believe agreed with that? One, 25, 1, 25 40, 15. 15, okay. It was eight. Oh. Right? Yeah. So, you know, the great Stephen Covey in his uh, Seven Habits book, he says effectively that we judge others by their behavior, we judge ourselves by our intentions. So, if we're intending to deliver a great experience, but uh, we're falling short, 
that's the perception of the client. It's not necessarily how we intended to behave, but that's how we're showing up in the eyes of the client, and it happens more often than not. It happens all too often. And it's about a feeling. You know, this is the big takeaway. I knew that what I was creating for my clients in those 11 years of selling was a feeling. And uh, some research out of McKinsey that 70% of buying experiences are based on how the customer feels they're being treated, right? Not, the, not how they're, quote, actually being treated, not how we intend to be treating them, not how we feel we are treating them, not what it says in our rule book about how we treat them, but how they feel they're being treated, right? It is about a feeling. And the great, late, great Maya Angelou said it best. I've learned that people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Well, this is, a, this is about life. This isn't just about uh, our personal lives. This is about our business lives as well. We have to really be, we really have to be thoughtful about how we want to leave our clients feeling because it's that feeling that's going to have them return, and it's that feeling that more so is going to have them refer business to us. That's a big deal when somebody refers business to you. First of all, most people are not connectors. They don't know how to do that. They're not comfortable doing that. So you really have to provide remarkable service for them not to just to come back, but to, to feel compelled to want to refer business to you. That's a big deal. So how might that feel? If, if we had to put it in just a few words, Here's, here's what I've come up with, just two statements. This is, how, this is how it might feel. Taken care of, think about that for a moment. When was the last time you did business with anyone and walked away from that experience feeling that? Taken care of. Walked away just feeling, wow, I just feel completely taken care of, right? Big deal, it's, it's setting the bar here, but look, the bar is right here right now. It's not, that, it's, it's not that hard to even get here. We're talking about going here, right? The other feeling is, that you've thought of everything, right? So you've done the critical thinking for your clients. Your clients don't want to have to think critically. That's work, right? You, you want them to walk away feeling these two things. Wow, I felt completely taken care of, and they thought of everything, right? When was the last time you felt that way as a customer of anyone, as a client of anyone? And if you can create this uh, in, in your teams, and I, and I recommend, by the way, I always recommend putting this into the hiring process. So when you're sitting across from a candidate, you could say to them, look, at the end of the day, our ultimate goal is to leave every prospect and client feeling these two things taken care of and as if we've thought of everything. How do you, how do you think, Mr. or Mrs. Candidate, that might play out here? What might that look like? What did that look like in your prior job? Right? Low-tech low uh, way of, of measuring for customer service aptitude. So the way I see it, we're all looking for the same thing in business. We're all looking to increase our profits, right? And the quickest path to increasing profits is repeat and referral business. In fact, in fact, repeat and referral business is such a huge, uh, such a huge contributing factor to uh, increased profitability. But it comes from it comes from our loyal clients. It's been proven actually statistically. More research out of Bain and Company: eighty to ninety percent of your your referral business, not even your repeat business, eighty to ninety percent of your referral business comes from your raving fans, your loyal clients. The people who would, who would say 9 or 10 when asked the question, on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely is it you'd recommend us to a friend or colleague? They answer 9 or 10, those are your promoters, those are your loyal fans, your, your, your uh, walking billboards, right? And they are, again, responsible for 80 to 90% of your referral business. How do you do that? You get really good at creating remarkable experiences. That's it. That's the formula. You want to increase profits? You start here. You start with getting really thoughtful about creating remarkable customer experiences. And today, I'm, I'm sharing my, my most favorite um, facet of creating these remark remarkable experiences, and that, and that is how to anticipate client needs. And maybe even show them that you know them better than you know themselves, which is a pretty cool thing if you can pull it off. Some other, uh, and, and a lot of you have heard or seen this before, but I want to share what, why this is important. So that it costs six to seven times, six to seven times more to attract and acquire a new customer than it does to just retain an existing one. Here's the big question that I, that I ask based on this, and this is mind-boggling. Why are we spending so many of our dollars on advertising and marketing when traditionally advertising and marketing is really geared towards bringing new people in the door, right? Oftentimes, the new customers are more incentivized to become customers than we're incentivizing loyalty with our, with our clients and even paying attention to those loyal clients, right? If a fraction of those dollars, I'm not saying get rid of advertising and marketing, but even if a small fraction of those dollars, the same dollars we spent on advertising and marketing, was invested 
in, into the customer experience, I believe we'd, we'd see great, great rewards, right? And, and the numbers prove this. So let's, let's talk about this notion of anticipating client needs. Uh, the late, great Steve Jobs, he, he said it best. A lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. How many of you, how many of you here today own an iPad or a tablet? <coughs> All right, almost every hand going up. How many of you knew six years ago that an iPad or a tablet was missing from your lives? <laughs> right? A lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. He was, he was referring to focus groups, that when you bring people together, in a focus group, they, don't, they won't necessarily have all the answers for you because a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. Some great examples of that coming up here. But first, I want to make the distinction because it's an important distinction to make between meeting client needs and actually anticipating needs. So we'll do this with a little, little bit of fun. This is the way a Chinese food uh, takeout container has looked for decades, decades and decades, and still it's being used some places, but but it's, but it's now been replaced by something else because we had to meet a need, right? And, and what's broken about this? What doesn't work about this style of container? Can't put it in the microwave. Can't put it in the microwave. Is that what you're going to say, Kim? It could leak because it's not tightly sealed. OK, it's actually a really creative form of origami. If you ever open one up, it's pretty impressive. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, the metal handle, look, it's a carryout container. We're likely going to go home and try to reheat it. And we've all done that at least once where we forgot and got <laughs> sparks in the mic microwave. So it only took them, I don't know, 50 years, but they finally got rid of the handle, right? And that was meeting a need. Another example, the ketchup bottle. What's, now that, what is fundamentally, what's broken about the, the, the traditional glass ketchup bottle? It just doesn't come out, and isn't that the point? Yeah, right? So, so it only took them decades and decades, but what did they do? They finally put it in a, pl a squeezable plastic container, turned it upside down, and now we can get our ketchup out, right? And the last example I have for is meeting a need rather than anticipating a need. The production automobile has actually been around since the late 1800s, right? Anybody know what kind of car that is? Somebody in here knows what that is. Thunderbird? Thunderbird? No, I, think I think it's an Impala. <coughs> like from the 50s, maybe? Well, it's missing something. And, and it's, it, 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 you know, cars were missing this thing that I'll have you guess on. Cars were missing this thing for about 70 years. Okay. Seven, yes. <laughs> Cup holders, <laughs> cup holders. And now, today, there are more cup holders in cars than there are seats, right? But it only took them 70 years to catch on, right? Now, this is, this is what we call meeting a need, right? Now, imagine the, 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 early, the early drivers, the people who were driving cars back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, mid-1900s, uh, they probably got thirsty while they were driving. They probably had a beverage in the car, maybe you know, trying to balance it between their knees or whatever the case may be. So it took us a long time to come around. This is not anticipating needs. This is meeting needs, and it's taking a long time to do it. Now let's talk about the anticipatory nature of doing business with clients and, and really uh, the thoughtful approach of anticipating those needs. One of my favorite stories is uh, from the hotel business. So this is, you know, in the hotel business, uh, they're, they're always sort of competing for market share. There's so many big, big brands, and then there's the boutique hotels. And let's face it. Uh, hotels, there, there's a wide range, you know, of hotels and star ratings and the experience that you're being provided with. But at the end of, at the bless you, but at the end of the day, a hotel is has rooms and it has beds and it has TVs and you know we have all the same kind of amenities. So how do you really up the experience? Well, one hotel really figured how to how to uh, up the experience and anticipate needs of clients, whereas most hotels, of course, no pets are allowed and that's 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 a standard. At, um, at this place, at Hotel Monaco, uh, that's not the policy. In fact, the conversation goes something like this when you check in. Do you have any pets with you today? No. Would you like one? <laughs> and if you say yes, you get a goldfish. <laughs> right? They say, look, our housekeeping crew is going to take care of the fish. There's nothing you have to do. They're going to feed it. They're going to change the water if you're here long enough. And all we ask is that you name it. This one was named Janice. And if you come back a year or even five years later, the conversation goes something like this. Welcome back, Mr. Johnson. Uh, we're all set for you. Uh, by the way, would you like Janice to come up and spend the night with you again? <laughs> <laughs> so creative, fun, anticipating a client need of having a companion sometimes, right? So now, some of these things can be really quite simple, like notching out the back of a chair in a mall eatery. Now, the ladies get this right away. The guys, you're slow to get this. I was slow to get this. Purses, shopping bags, right? 
And, and we've all had that thing happen where we, we put a bag on the back of a chair and it slides right off onto the germ infested floor of a mall eatery, right? So it's a small thing, but this is an anticipatory thing that, that, that uh, leaves a good impression. Those are my feet. This is at, um, at uh, Destination Maternity. My, we have a one year old. When my wife was pregnant, we visited Destination Maternity a few times. They're smart in anticipating the needs of the husbands that might be coming along by supplying men's fitness and men's health and having a soccer game on and a comfy recliner for you to lounge in. Um, this is something a friend of mine sent me, knowing that I'm so passionate about anticipating needs. Uh, he took this picture in a Chick-fil-A bathroom, and I know that sounds really horrible, but there was nobody else in the restroom. It's just a sign he was taking a picture of. He, he, later he thought, well, that was creepy. I just had my phone out in the back. <laughs> but the sign said, fathers, did you forget diapers or wipes today? It's okay. We now keep an assortment of diapers and wipes on hand just in case. Please see a team member for assistance, right? Really smart. Really not a, not, a, not a big deal to keep those things on hand, but really a wow thing, wow factor for, for, for dads, right? My, I, I hope that there's one in the ladies' room as well. You know, the guys, yeah, we're forgetful. Sometimes we'll forget the whole diaper bag. Somebody said, yeah, sometimes we forget the kid. <laughs> but uh, very smart. And this is a picture I took at uh, our local Chipotle in the Kentlands. So my wife and I were at the back of this very long line when this lady walked in on crutches. And what impressed me is that she didn't even make it to the back of the line before one of the Chipotle employees ran out from behind the counter with a clipboard and an order form and said, ma'am, please, you don't have to wait in that line. You're on crutches, for goodness sake. Have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. Here's an order form. Fill it out. I'll be back in a moment to get things started for you. Right? Anticipating client needs. Thoughtful. Memorable. Uh, Wegmans Food Markets. We're finally getting, getting these in Maryland. But they've been doing this for a long time, where they, they have the, the little flip-out uh, stool for kids to be able to reach the sink. We've all done that awkward thing where we try to lift the child that can't reach the sink, and, and it's awkward for them and for you, and they, you know, they're trying to wash their hands. So little stool, little flip-out. Uh, Ikea not to be outdone and actually to one-up them. Uh, kids have their own sink at Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kid-friendly. Now parent-friendly. Uh, fundamentally, there's something, you know, for, for decades, this is, this is traditionally the way that toys have been packaged. And there's fundamentally something really not right about that that can be quite frustrating. What is it? There's, yeah, zip ties and shrink wrap and screws. And so, uh, you know, you get something like this as a gift for your child. And you spend the next 20 minutes because you need a Phillips screwdriver and you need scissors and uh, wire cutters and, and a bucket load of patients to get the, the darn thing out of the package, right? So Amazon and, uh, partnered up with some big toy manufacturers like Mattel and Fisher Price. They get really smart. They've been doing this for at least a year or two now. You may not be aware, but this is an option on many toys now. It's called frustration-free packaging. Actually, it's not just offered on toys. It's, I just got a HDMI cable in the mail yesterday. And it was the same kind of thing. It was just in a Ziploc bag. It was frustration-free packaging. But for toys, it's really, really useful. We've ordered things this way, my wife and I. This is what it looks like. That same pirate ship slides right out of the box. No screws, no zip ties. None of that slides right out, right? I mean, look, this, I mean, it's, it's clear that the only reason you're really having to do this is for shelf appeal, right, and to keep kids from, from, uh, from pulling it out, right? Theft. Theft. That too, yeah, that too. Um, this, is, this is an example I wanted to share with you. A friend of mine uh, owns Chef Tony's restaurant in Bethesda. Some of you may, may know of, of Chef Tony's. And so uh, Tony shared this with me because it, it blew him away. Don't try to read the small print. I've got it blown up, and I'll read it to you here in a sec. So Michael and Son is a big local business. They do everything from electrical to HVAC, plumbing. They do it all. You've probably seen them advertised. They, they have a big presence in our, in our area. And I can't vouch for their customer experience. I've not been a customer. But I can vouch for the anticipatory nature of what they're doing. And their intentions are, are, are really remarkable. And Tony was wowed by this. And that's why he sent it along to me. After he made his initial appointment for a plumbing need in the restaurant, they sent him this email. You know, traditional, traditional uh, verification or confirmation of time and date and location. But then it went on to say this. Next paragraph said, how often have you opened your door to a service repairman only to feel extremely uncomfortable once he's inside your house? For this reason, we've attached the picture of the technician we've chosen to send to your home, as well as a short biography that we've compiled. It is our hope that you will recognize and feel comfortable with our employee in your home and around your family. We want you to know you're dealing with a professional who cares about your personal safety, the safety of your family, and the well-being 
and security of your home. Meet your technician. This just proves, I believe, proves Steve Jobs' point that a lot of times you know, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. I don't believe a focus group may have come up with this. This is really, this is really leading edge stuff. This is really anticipating a client need that most people aren't even talking about or aware of, right? And it's just sort of you know, one of these things that's just always been that way, so that's the way it's always going to be. But they were talking about it, and they were saying, how can we solve this? How can we, how can we bring that anticipatory nature to our business, and, and how might it uh, improve our business and our customer experience and ultimately our profitability right, as a result? Another favorite example, uh, you may not be aware of this if, if you've never lived in Canada, but uh, I'm going to show you a quick video that, that illustrates a really powerful point here. Every July 1st in Canada is moving day. So every lease in Quebec runs from July 1st to June 30th, right? Every lease. So you can imagine what that means to, uh, to Quebec, right? And, and, and other areas where the same thing happens. I'll show you the video and it explains it all. Here we go. On July 1st long weekend in Canada, a cultural phenomenon happens. The people of Quebec move. They call it moving day. This leads to all kinds of chaos. Imagine 225,000 people in a city of 1.8 million moving all at the same time. There isn't enough of anything. Trucks, movers, even boxes. This year, IKEA helped Quebecers make moving easier with the simple act of providing moving boxes. But not just any moving boxes. These boxes were printed with moving tips, a checklist, a helpful dinner offer at the local IKEA, and of course, a great offer on new IKEA furniture for the new place. To get the boxes into the hands of the people, we created pyramids of boxes at giveaway sites at the store and around town. We printed other boxes with headlines and turned those into media. We clipped them up and people took them away. We also promoted the boxes on radio and took over the radio station so it could play music to get people moving, commercial free, on the actual day. The results? Visitors were up 14% from the same weekend the previous year, and sales went up 24.5%. That's like sales for an entire extra store. And that's a better moving day for everyone. So anticipating client needs can actually be profitable, right? Remarkable. So an anticipatory culture implies a lot of things. But I'm just going to shortcut it and tell you that it implies these two things. It's an intersection between precision and care. Having an anticipatory nature in your business implies that you, you look at everything through the lens of precision and care. Right? I talked about those two things earlier, that the client ends up feeling taken care of and as if you've thought of everything. It's about setting a standard below which you refuse to go even when others around you are compromising theirs. That's what this is about. And this is how an anticipatory culture can actually drive profitability. But I want to open this up for questions. And, and like Kelly mentioned, um, if you have a question, please come to the microphone. Good morning. Jerome Leonard, CIO with Taylor Leonard Corporation. Uh, my question is, how do you shift the traditional mindset? Because I, I've been around call centers. Most people, when they think of customer and care, they're thinking of handling complaints. What you shared with us is clearly on the other end of the spectrum. But how do you shift that mindset from just, we need to deal with the complaints to where you're talking about being anticipatory? Yeah, great question, Jerome. Thank you. So a couple things come to mind. In a call center, it's a really good idea, by the way, to have a mirror right near their phone. People don't like the way they look when they're not happy. And so if you put a mirror in front of the employee, their attitude is going gonna, is gonna to move in a positive direction. right? But to, to more specifically answer, answer your question, you can start by getting the employees involved in the conversation. Too often in corporation, what ends up happening is we push this agenda onto our employees. And I always say, your people will support what they help to create. Your people will support what they help to create. So having a conversation with those same employees, like asking a question like, what do you think are the most common pet peeves? of our customers here, our clients here, and having them answer that, because they know. They know what these pet peeves are, but they're, just, but, but they're, but they're, they're, they're not coming at it at, from a solution-oriented uh, mindset. They're coming at it from, 
I can't wait to hang out with my friends after work and talk about all the stupid things that customers do, right? <laughs> but if you get them talking about it and then, and then invite them to create solutions for those pet peeves, that's how you start to change the conversation and, and change the, uh, the mindset. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome, Jerome. Hi, Kim. Good morning. Uh, Kim Foley with Brand and Focus Video Training. I'm wondering how you work with companies. We're all small businesses here, and clearly we can all use your help. I love all of your ideas. I think it's amazing to, to shift it and think differently. So how do you work with companies that are small like, like us? Yeah, so for, for small companies, I love working with small companies because when I work with big companies, I'm only able to interview um, a segment of their employees. I just started working this uh, just last week with a company that has eight employees. I love that because I'm able to sit down with every single person in the company and have a one-on-one. -on -one. And I have two main goals when I do that. One is to measure for customer service aptitude. I've got a, I've got a questionnaire that I take them through and it helps me understand them better, what their come from is. It helps me understand the overall culture of the organization. And it also, it also allows them to have a voice and provide their unique perspective, something a lot of employees haven't yet had a chance to do because I let them do all the talking. So they get to feel that, that they're, even if, even if, and this doesn't happen, but even if nothing came as a result of them sharing what they're sharing, they, they get to feel heard, right? And, and there's a sense of promise there. So that's a start. And I'll work with the leadership, I'll work closely with the leadership team to talk about um, what it's going to look like when, when we're providing a, a, a more systematic approach and a more intentional design to their customer experience. And then we'll design workshops around that so that, again, your people will support what they help to create. So we want to get the entire team, and it's easy to do with a small business, get the entire team having conversations. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, anticipating client needs is one of the modules. That's an entire half day module where we get their wheels turning with all these fun examples, often from outside of their own industry. Some, those are some of the best to really get people thinking. And, and then we'll just go to work on creating our own ideas within that company that are the same in nature, anticipating client needs. And what about solopreneurs, people like me who don't have employees, per se? Um, do you have any workshops or any ways that we can you know, get some benefit out of all your knowledge? Because I think it would make a big difference in our bottom line. Yeah, well, thanks. Now, I, I've worked with some solopreneurs over the years. Uh, and, there, and there is certainly a one-on-one -on -one model where I, can, where I work uh, on a consultative basis. Great, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm Stacy Brown from Sinorama Silver Spring. Um, I want to kind of pick, piggyback on the first question when you said, you know, getting employees involved. Do you have any ideas about some employee um, incentives that you might be able to offer to get them engaged in this process? Yeah, so that's a tricky one, you know. So when I was in the car business, it, it probably won't surprise you. We were, we were gauged on our customer satisfaction index. You know, back in the late, uh, late 90s, mid to late 90s, you would get a bubble form in the mail after you bought a car and you were asked to, you know, complete this bubble form and you were rating your experience with your salesperson, your finance person, and so on. And in the car business, they're, they're really known as being incentivized dollar-wise to provide a great experience, but really more importantly to get good scores, right? So that's really tricky. There was, now, I, I, will, I, will, I have to say that I worked at a great place that, that uh, our values aligned. And you were never allowed to coach clients on how to fill out a survey. You've probably, you've probably had salespeople say to you or service uh, personnel say to you, we strive for fives. If there's something you can't answer a five to, please call me first. Let me fix it. That's coaching on the survey, right? That's not asking for, that's not asking for real accurate feedback from a client. So, so when it comes to incentives, you have to be really careful. I think that just giving clients or I'm sorry, giving employees a voice mm -hmm. is a pretty big incentive. Your people will support what they help to create. In order for them to create, they've got to have a voice. That's a big incentive. You know, Dan Pink wrote a wonderful book called Drive, and it talks about the intrinsic motivators that we all have, that uh, we all want to feel a sense of autonomy, be self-directed. We all want to feel that we're on a journey of mastery, that we're always getting better at something and making progress and that we have a sense of purpose. We feel that we're working at something that's bigger than us. And the, the, the incentives and the compensation actually aren't even fourth or fifth. They fall further down the line. So I, I would answer it that way. Provide a sense of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Give your, give your employees a voice, and it'll work wonders. Thank you.